So M39 talks about solar, wind, geothermal, and hydrogen, so some more of our renewable resources. Um, so the first few pages, I don't have any um, sticky notes on there. Um, you do need to read it um, because eventually you'll need to know all of the different types of solar energy. So um, this diagram up here, it's pretty straightforward. It's just showing where there's the most um, solar radiation, um, which I think is probably, if you think about it, common sense. Um, the desert regions versus the northwest, um, northeast being less. Um, so this is areas that we could potentially put solar panels or use solar energy more. Um, and then we've got several different types. So we've got passive solar um, heating. We've got active solar heating. Um, we touched a little bit on this um, a couple sections ago. Um, so make sure you do read it. And then it talks about solar water heater systems and photovoltaic systems, the PV cells. Um, and then looking at um, CST, which is concentrating solar thermal electricity generation. Um, so like I said, it's important to read through all of this. Um, at the very end, I put some bullets or some sticky notes that kind of pertain to the whole section that you just read. Um, so it says, be able to describe and explain the advantages and disadvantages of solar energy. So that is that entire couple pages that um, are previous. So the main types are passive active photovoltaic cells and solar thermal which is cst so what are the advantages and disadvantages of those and of course you'll need to know what they are and you'll do that by reading um, and then moving over to wind um, wind is the fastest growing energy source in the world and the u.s so that's just a statement um, but i want you to know the mechanics of how it works so if we look at the picture here um, the wind is turning a turbine which generates electricity in the generator. So um, same kind of concept as the water, except for in, um, instead it's air. Uh, and then if we look at this diagram up here, so notice how um, in figure 39.7 that if we look at China, China has the greatest wind capacity, but if we look at the percentage of energy coming from wind, China is last. So why is that? Um, and that's what this bullet, um, the sticky note is about. So if China has a high wind capacity, why is the percent so low? So think about, um, you know, China has a huge land mass, but how many people live in China? How many people in China are using electricity? That has a lot to do with it. Um, and then it says down below, the greatest will be in the ocean using offshore breezes. So our future wind use is what this re is referring to. So our greatest... Uh, potential is using offshore wind turbines. Um, and so there's been some, a little bit of um, uh, resistance to putting these in over on the East Coast. Um, and the chapter does talk about that a little bit. Um, but that's our greatest potential. There's actually a lot more wind. Um, it's really constant because of those offshore breezes. And um, the efficiency is much higher. And so there's lots of benefits. The drawbacks might be aesthetic. Um, so that's the main thing is um, aesthetic to the people that live there. So moving on to 476, um, why does the U.S. lag behind other countries in wind use? So we are kind of not doing very well as far as wind use. And why is that? Um, it kind of has to do a lot with um, people complaining and the aesthetics. And, and it does have something to do with um, species that are affected by the turbines. Um, and why are they grouped into farms? So we see wind turbines. Um, this is an offshore uh, plant. And you can see that they're grouped together. Um, the ones up at Bernie, if you've seen those, and you can actually see them from town, um, they're grouped together in a farm. So why? Why do we do that? Um, and then know the advantages and disadvantages of wind. Um, so what is good about it? What's bad? Um, wind turbines are pretty amazing. Um, they, they're they popping up all over the place. But if you look at this picture, if you've never seen a wind turbine, um, down at the bottom at the base, I'll kind of zoom in here, um, you can see, imagine you know a person standing along this um, kind of fence that's around it. So right in here, there's um, kind of this fence. Look how big it is. So these things are ginormous. Um, the ones up by Bernie, um, they're huge. I mean, think about it. You can see it from writing. Um, you can actually see the 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 turbines themselves. So, or uh, the wind, um, the wind turbine, and so it's it's pretty amazing how big they are. Um, so, moving on, um, which countries are the largest geothermal energy users? So, moving on to geothermal, um, which countries 
there's several. Um, and what is the source of geothermal energy? Like what heats the water? Where does it come from? Um, what is that source? Like how do we heat the water to eventually produce steam to turn the turbine? Um, and how is electricity you generated? Well, you might guess a turbine. Um, so we're heating up water, um, producing steam. That steam um, turns a turbine and that produces electricity in the generator. And so moving up to the top, um, advantages and disadvantages of geothermal. So what is good, what is bad? And um, there's also something called a ground source heat pump. So this is mostly residential, not really on a large scale like for a city or anything like that. It's mostly residential. Um, so where does the ground source heat pump energy come from? So what is heating there? It's different than the geothermal. And some people refer to it as geothermal, but in a sense it's not really geothermal because the energy is not coming from um, the radioactivity of the earth. It's coming from something else. And then moving to page 478, um, how is hot water heat pump more efficient than 100%? So they refer to it, um, if you look above the sticky note, 200 and 250%. So how is that? How is that? How does it? How is it more than 100% um, efficient? And so um, there's a way that it is. So read about that. And then the last part is the hydrogen fuel cell. Um, so this is kind of an up and coming thing. Um, there's been several people producing hydrogen um, fuel cell cars, kind of um, experimenting with those. They're all kind of just experimental. There's nothing really in uh, mass production or anything like that at this moment. Um, but hydrogen fuel cells are kind of the new thing. Um, and I just want you to look at how is it different. So a regular battery, so the hydrogen fuel cell cars have a battery. Um, but it's run on hydrogen versus um, cadmium or lithium um, type batteries. So how is it different? How does it run different? Um, you know, is it ever going to run out of energy? Um, do we have to throw them away like batteries? Um, how does that work? Um, and then what is the product of the reaction to the fuel cell? So look at the equation under the sticky note. And what is the, there's two products. So what are the products of that reaction? Um, it might surprise you. And then the last page here, um, what is the alternative method to obtaining hydrogen for the fuel cell? So there's one way, um, we use natural gas to um, extract the hydrogen. Well, that's using natural gas. So if we can get away from using fossil fuels, um, there are several ways. Um, one way that's not mentioned in this book um, is the possibility of using algae to um, to extract the hydrogen. And so that's pretty interesting. It's not mentioned in the book, um, but that is a possibility. But the book does mention a couple other possibilities. So what are those? And what is the efficiency of a hydrogen fuel cell? So, um, so how good are they and how efficient are they? And that's it for M39.